Um, welcome, uh, everybody, to the second Medieval Work in Progress seminar of the academic year, um, uh, postponed from September due to uh, train strikes and various other challenges. Um, so thank you for coming here. I know also that tonight is a busy night of interesting lectures, so thank you for choosing Team Courtauld. Um, and I'm sorry that we end up being in this slightly weird large lecture theatre for this, it's because there are a number of other events going on as well, um, uh, but uh, we're grateful to the Research Board for, for squeezing us in here. In a moment I'm going to introduce um, the uh, speaker tonight, but I just wanted to um, whet your appetites, as it were, with a number of events uh, next uh, semester, which aren't necessarily up on the kind of main Courtauld Research Forum uh, website and are not yet open for booking, but in case you want to make a note in your diaries, um, you can see there that we've got a number of uh, talks. So on Wednesday the 17th of January, uh, Katrine Cobden Apple talking about entanglement um, in shared cultural spaces, Hebrew book art in Iberia. We have our uh, annual ICMA lecture with Nina Rowe on the 7th of February. Uh, on the 6th of March, uh, Elena Paulino is talking about um, architecture in 14th century Castile. And then if you're really keen and uh, want to put in dates for the summer, we've also got um, two more work in progress seminars um, on the uh, 1st of May with Maggie Cosland and on the 15th of May, our Paul Cosley Memorial Lecture looking at um, uh, architecture in the Netherlands in the 15th. Uh, in the 15th century. And just to add as well, for one more event that will go up, uh, the call for papers of it will go up hopefully quite soon, we have our annual medieval postgraduate colloquium, which is scheduled for the 15th of March, that's a Friday, um, and uh, a number of people in the room are just putting together the, the call for papers for that, but um, uh, always a good event. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Neve Baller, um, uh, who is a Courtauld alumna, but has been uh, very busy since uh, graduating from here with a PhD in 2014. Um, she is Associate Professor in Art History at Northeastern University um, and Head of their Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit. Um, she's also published widely um, uh, most recently, her book, uh, Experiencing the Last Judgment, came out with Routledge in 2021, and I think that the work that she's talking about tonight is a kind of uh, project that's emerged from that. Um, but she also published an important article in the Art Bulletin last year, Containing the Uncontainable, Kinesthetic Analogies, and an Early Christian Box and is speeding, she has research leave this semester, and is uh, due to submit a book manuscript that looks at the reception of Byzantium in Dublin in the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that work, uh, that book, I think, will serve as a kind of taster for a book that she is working on um, that is also due for publication with Routledge in 2024, a handbook to the modern reception of Byzantium. So um, lots of projects there, and we look forward to her paper tonight, which is on birth, death, and protective imagery in a rocking church in the 10th century. From, oh, something dropped off. Sorry. <laughs> Cappadocia, I think, uh, is, is, should be there. Um, uh, the, a little teaser for you. Um, uh, just to say the format, as usual, will be that we will have a talk of about somewhere between uh, 45 and uh, 60 minutes, followed by questions, and then I hope that you will be able to stay and join us for uh, drinks and more informal questions uh, uh, afterwards. So, thank you, Lee. Thank, thank you, Tom. It's lovely to be back. Um, tonight's talk, can you hear me? So tonight's talk is um, very much a work in progress, which I'm sure everybody says that when they come to, to present at this uh, series. Um, but I have, I've been in the, sort of the end stages of um, a sort of a completely different project, and I've come back to this, having written it for the original date, and so things are a little bit hazy, some things are a little bit rough, but I hope that this will be 
um, a really great sort of opportunity to um, get feedback and, and talk about the, some of the issues that I'm going to, to raise. So, is it loud enough? So, life was unpredictable and often precarious for the people of medieval Byzantium. Life expectancies were low and mortality rates were high, particularly for young children and women. Securing divine protection could determine outcomes for you and your loved ones, particularly in the face of illness and childbearing. Very often, however, all that remains of the cycles of existential threat, fear and trust in God experienced by medieval people are the objects um, of material culture through which they sought God's protection. Here I explore uh, what's left of the image of Christ's nativity in the 10th century rock cut church of Eritash in the Perestream Valley of Cappadocia in rural Turkey as an indexical trace of the community that once came to secure God's protection assisted by the potent imagery there. The palpable emphasis on Christ's infancy in this funerary church, which hosted many graves, including those of women and children, through a highly unusual and extended um, cycle concerning his birth, along with the inclusion of powerful elements such as the elusive Satwa palindrome within the nativity, will be interpreted as the employment of persuasive visual analogies in response to the struggles that families faced in the community. Underpinning the discussion, I hope, is a demonstration of the role that imagery, even the damaged traces that survive at Eritash, can play in viscerally connecting us to past communities who've otherwise left no mark on the historical record. The performative agency of imagery in one community's navigation of birth and death is traced, serving um, as a model um, for the reintegration of groups, regions and practices that have been traditionally marginalised in scholarship. Going beyond the textual paradigms previously used to interpret this imagery, which tracked the unusual scenes and motifs to apocryphal literature, assigning a generative role um, purely to text, I explore the powerful synchronicity of image and inscription in effecting change in the face of the medieval life cycle. The powerful words within the imagery that may have wielded autonomous agency raises a contentious debate concerning the relationship of magic and religious experience. Recent focus on material agency within the humanities makes it an opportune moment to discuss this potency aside from polarised dichotomies between magic and religion, between high and low cultures. The direct performance of this community's inscribed imagery is reframed as giving access to past religious experience if visual epistemics are prioritised. From the 7th to the 9th century, um, Cappadocia, sorry, Cappadocia was an embattled Boer province of the Eastern Roman Empire. Raids from the Arab Emirates of northern Syria were frequent, but by the mid-10th century, Cappadocia was a secure and prosperous province in the middle of the empire due to the retaking of Eastern Anatolia. The mid-10th to late 12th um, sorry, the mid-10th to late 11th centuries saw a burgeoning of towns, rock-cut churches, monastic settlements and artistic patronage in Cappadocia. The built environment um, of the region was um, rock-cut because carving structures um, from the soft volcanic rock there was practical and economical. Over 700 uh, rock-cut ch churches and chapels survive, but there is um, no clear information on who used these churches. Recent scholarship has refuted the monastic paradigm prevailing since the first antiquarian travel travellers passed through the region in the 19th and early 20th centuries, which maintained that these spaces belonged to ascetic monastic communities seeking refuge in these cave-like spaces. It's now generally agreed that lay communities used many of these churches, and recent thought has sought to explain the disproportionate number of churches in Cappadocia, which far exceed the normal liturgical needs of the region's population. Um, as burial chapels for the laity used primarily for commemorative purposes, some of which may have had a skeleton monastic staff um, servicing them, according to the late Robert Oosterhout, who said there seems to have been something of an obsession throughout Cappadocia with death and its commemoration. Understanding the rock cut structures within the Perestrema Valley in the northern foothills of the Hassandai Massif in the province of Aksarai in western Cappadocia also previously characterised as a bustling sort of monastic environment, has shifted similarly. 
The deep river gorge, cutting through solidified volcanic ash for about six miles, contains an impressive concentration of rock cut churches and settlements, carved into the steep cliffs on either side of the Suo Melindes River, particularly between the modern Turkish villages of Itlara and Belisermo. The four churches um, of the so-called Itlara group, to which Eritash belongs, along with Purenlisiki Kilisi, Yelanle Kilisi and Kokar Kilisi, all dated to the 10th century on stylistic and epigraphical grounds, and so named because of their proximity to the modern Turkish village, forms an explicit cluster there. Uh, the unusual iconographies and stylistic traits of the Athara group churches, first published by Nic uh, Nicole and Michel Thierry in 1963, which remains the only monograph on them, suggested um, that a distinct community was responsible for the churches. The proliferation of burial churches suggests that many were separate spaces existing primarily for funerary purposes. The variety in the size, nature and disposition of the burials, their varied inscriptions and the qualitative differences in the imagery accompanying them points firmly towards the close involvement of a lay community. Named after the cliff fall that obliterated its western wall, Eri Tash is a single nave barrel vaulted church relatively large in comparison to the other churches of the Atlara group. It's dated by a dipinto um, to the right of the apse to the early 10th century. The badly damaged text commemorates Juan Pariates, giving his name and some mid-tier military titles, um, who is meant to have uh, decorated the church of the Teotocus. One now enters through the large funerary chamber that was previously underneath the nave, uh, which was once separated by a now disappeared wooden floor. And underneath the church and well beyond it, one encounters what the theories refer to as a vast necropolis, hosting mostly lay burials. Greatly damaged, the original Christological cycle of the Naos may be broadly discerned. A large cross occupies the length of the barrel vault at its apex. The unique form and size of this decorated cross dominates the space, declaring a protective function for the imagery that surrounds it. Prominent post-iconoclastic post crosses in Cappadocia are generally considered to have been apotropaic in some sense, and burial inscriptions in the church all call upon the, um, not all of them, but some of them call upon the power of the cross in the face of death. The cross is flanked by three superimposed registers of painted scenes on the north and south sides of the vault. The programme reads from east to west or right to left, like Syriac writing, starting on the south side of the vault with the Annunciation and Visitation. Beyond this point, the rock has fallen. Um, but they're actually a little bit cut off there, sorry. Um, underneath is the Nativity, so what you can see on the second here, I will show um, a sort of a line drawing so you can see the details more clearly in a minute. So underneath is the Nativity, comprising the visit of the Magi, the Nativity proper, Christ's first bath by the midwives and the visit of the shepherds, who, who are named after the magic square. The lowest level hosts the dream of Joseph, the flight into Egypt, and Herod ordering the massacre of the innocents, although the murderers themselves have disappeared. On the south wall below are the baptism and the entry into Jerusalem, but everything else is gone. The narrative sequence continues on the lower register of the north side of the vault, with the denial of Peter, the washing of the feet, um, the Garden of Gethsemane, and on the north wall, uh, the women at the tomb. Then the upper registers, so going up to the top of the image, um, on the north side of the vault, they return with an obvious disregard for narrative consistency to the theme of Christ's birth. A prominent tableau of the Virgin, enthroned with the Christ child and flanked by angels, is included underneath the cross. And underneath, running from east to west, are apocryphal scenes, the Annunciation at the Well, and the three visions <laughs> of the Magi. The theories thought that perhaps there was an intentional theme here that's escaped us. And I, I guess my argument is that the idiosyncrasies that we can see in the image and what survives stemmed from a desire for a protective encounter with the divine in the face of existential threat. The programs of the Atlara churches are dominated by two main themes, Christ's birth and Christ's death. Um, seen at Egri Tash in the unusually extensive representation of Christ's infancy, um, the passion cycle which has largely been destroyed and also in the last judgment of which only a few fallen fragments um, have been found. 
throughout the Athara programs, there is an obvious inclusion of unique, powerful features such as angelic and demonic names, symbols like the Holy Rider um, spearing demons, the repeated use of the, the cross in unusual forms, and the Sator formula. Elements that are very often labelled as magic in Byzantine studies. In this powerful mixture of Christological imagery and potent motifs, the needs of the people using the images are palpable. The creation of potent imagery pertaining to the birth and death of Christ stemmed from what it meant for their own births and deaths. The reason why <coughs> birth and death would have dominated the mind of those creating these churches um, are not difficult to discern. Those frequenting these foundations lived in a harsh and unpredictable climate, dominated by subsistence farming, which was regularly affected by animal and plant disease, high infant mortality rates and short life expectancies. Life in rural Cappadocia would have been, as Eric Cooper and Michael Decker put it, precarious, often miserable and usually brief. These monuments are the sole surviving testimony to the real medieval people who created and interacted with them, and they're almost palpable in the striking visceral imagery that they left behind. The general prioritising of textual over visual evidence in Byzantine studies, and the unusual and in this case incomplete nature of the painted programmes, has meant that these churches and what they may be able to tell us about a rural community in Byzantium have been largely overlooked. Access to the past is frequently delimited, uh, delimited by texts written by elite men, often from urban settings, and the predominance of text in historical inquiry has also meant that a textual interpretive model has been imposed, which has limited understanding of these churches to tracing the apocryphal texts that they may or may not have been connected to. Although a greater number of passion scenes once existed, it's clear that the miracles and ministry of Christ were omitted, and the unusual infancy cycle received greatest prominence in being placed in the upper parts of the church, dominated by both the striking Apotropaic cross and the enlarged composition of the enthroned Theotokos and Child, which becomes a sort of an overwhelming presence in the space. The Theotokos, who made powerful uh, connection with viewers through eye contact, gesture and scale, is flanked by the archangels Michael and Gabriel, who also look outwards towards the viewer, each with a massive wing extending upwards. The two angels follow, um, are called, that, that follow are called Raphael, but presumably one should have been Uriel. These powerful figures, whose names were abundantly common in amuletic materials across cultures and religious traditions, protectively surround the mother and child. The archangels are, were regularly invoked for protection generally and in relation to the safe delivery of children from the earliest times. Framing the mother and child in this way, surmounted by a large cross, they seem to appear as a protective and powerful presence. The nativity on the opposite side of the vault, um, I'm going to show you the line drawing so you can see, um, has similarity to other Byzantine iterations. Joseph faces away despondent while Mary reclines looking towards Christ, swaddled in a manger to the right, blessing him with her right hand. The midwives bathe the infant Christ to the right. The magi, who were not present at Christ's birth, are included anachronistically to the left. They were probably, they were probably all originally labelled with their apocryphal names, Gaspar, Melchior and Balthazar, as they were in Cocartelisi and Purenlisiki, but only Melchion now remains. They were named and given similar prominence at Kokar Khaleesi, you can see here they're at the Nativity, um, and at Pirelli Misiki Khaleesi. Um, but at Pirelli they approach an older infant seated on the Virgin's lap in a separate composition underneath the Nativity. So you can see that at least five scenes are de devoted to the Magi at, at, uh, at Eritash, so that their presence is greatly disproportionate to the few verses that they receive in Matthew's Gospel. It seems from their prominence, um, particularly at Eritash, that there may have been a special devotion to them in this group. Um, answering the nativity on the other side of the cross, um, you can see the highly esoteric apocryphal visions of the Magi um, that take up a considerable amount of space on the vault, elongating the nativity cycle. According to the Armenian Book of Infancy, which was a 6th century translation of a now lost Syriac Apocrypha, each of the three Magi came into the cave to adore the infant in the manger and give their gift, but each of them received a different vision. Gaspar, King of India, saw the Son of God embodied, seated on the throne in glory. 
Balthazar, king of Arabia, saw the son of man, son of a king, seated on the highest of thrones in human form, and Melchion, the king of Persia, saw him bodily tortured and dead and risen from the dead. These three different visions on the, on the vault don't neatly reflect the text, um, which is probably what now survives of a, a sort of a wider tradition. Um, and we can see there's a fort scene also, which is now largely destroyed, uh, wherein they probably confer and confirm that this polymorphic display confirms Christ's divinity, as in the text. Each of the Magi is named above their vision, as in the text. Balthazar's vision, vision most notably diverges from the text, so that his vision of Christ's humanity is represented by means of an image of the infant Christ in his crib. Their appearances strangely differ from those in the nativity proper. For example, Melchion is a beardless youth um, there, while, while in the vision he has a dark beard. Reading from right to left, there is an age progression in these visions for both Christ and the Magi, which may form an early expression of later understandings of the Magi as representing the three ages of man. Christ develops from an infant to an adult with a longer beard, whilst the Magi range from youthful and unbearded um, to an older bearded type. The esoteric visions seem to support an interest in the human life cycle at every touch. The dominance of the Magi stems from what they meant for the community. Although the Magi were intimately connected to pil pilgrimage, they were also closely related to the protection of children, being frequently found on children's sarcophagi from an early date, such as the small early 4th century marble sarcophagus now in the Vatican Museums, which hosts an unusual combination of Ezekiel's vision of the resurrection of the dry bones with the Magi's visit to the Virgin and Child of the Epiphany. The, Vag the, the Magi were invoked here in the context of the child's hoped for, hoped for resurrection. They were also used in a talismanic uh, fashion on items that were worn. Uh, where Christological scenes survive on textiles, which is rare, um, the Magi's vi visit is one of the most popular scenes. And their repeated appearance, even on the same garment, seems to betray an apotropaic significance. This linen tunic from the 6th to 8th century um, from Egypt, now in the British Museum, is decorated with several images of the Magi, which clearly held a protective significance. The unusual prominence and additional scenes of the Magi at Eritash, which extend and lend a sort of a mystical presence and potency to the infancy cycle, add to the cumulative effect of the imagery, along with the cross, the virgin and child, and the esoteric details within the nativity proper that we're going to speak about shortly, particularly the Sator Square, suggesting that the inclusion of the Magi related to the protective purpose of the infancy cycle as a whole within this funerary context. In their dynamic advancement from the left, the Magi answer the shepherds who advance from the far right, providing a frame for the central tableau, despite the awkward frame given to the shepherds. The structure of the nativity at Eritash, shared with Kokar Khaleesi, so you can see the, the Magi and the shepherds form this sort of frame at Kokar Khaleesi as well, is relatively <coughs> unique, with the central scene protectively framed by the shepherds and Magi. Framing the Virgin and Child with shepherds and the Magi related to an ancient and hallowed type which was actually reproduced most closely at Purenlisi Kikilisi, where the seated virgin and an older infant form the centre of the composition rather than the nativity. The type is seen um, in an 8th century painting at the Monastery of the Syrians um, in the Wadi al Natrum, in the northern half dome of the main church, where the three named magi approach an enthroned virgin holding Christ in an oval, which is now lost, with the star of Bethlehem above. The Virgin is flanked by the Archangels Michael and Gabriel, and the Shepherds are placed symmetrically on the other side in a composition that reflects the, the design of four of the Monza Ampule, pilgrimage flasks um, from the Holy Land, which it suggested emulated Justinian's apse um, image in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. At Eritash, it's as if they sort of separated this type to isolate on the other one side of the vault the Virgin and Child, um, and that they use the, the flanking sort of shepherds and magi to put a protective framing around the nativity because it held analogous interest for the families in the community. The names attributed to the shepherds 
were derived from the so-called magic square. Only traces of the first two remain, uh, Sator and Arapo, but all five terms from the square were probably once included as they were in Kokar Khaleesi and Perendi Siki. Although the mystical assignment of these terms to Christian elements is found elsewhere, such as in North African amuletic materials, where they often designate the nails of the crucifixion, the attribution of the words from the square to the shepherds um, is only found in Cappadocia. The ordering of the, this originally Latin palindrome in the Eclara churches, beginning with Sator and written here in Greek, is the inverse of their order in the earlier Roman world, which usually began with Rotas. The earliest um, examples, which come from Pompeii, and then this one from Jura Europus, um, or these are sort of the earliest examples found, and then following these Roman instances, um, it can be found quite widely, from the fourth, all the way up to the 19th century, from Cappadocia to Egypt, and across Europe, even to other continents. The square has received a plethora of interpretations um, since the 19th century, which have sought to make it Stoic, Orphic, um, Pythagorean, Jewish, Mithraic, or Christian in origin. And there's a, a lot of literature on this, but really it's a moot point. Um, but regardless of our origins, the palindrome's popularity in Christian usage probably related to the fact that the letters could in fact be rearranged to spell <coughs> Pater Noster in cruciform, with both the Pater Noster and the cross wielding powerful apotropaic power in their own right, which and it then left two alphas and two omegas to be arranged as desired. Its popularity by the end of the Middle Ages and thereafter in Western Europe seems to have resulted from its perceived protective uses um, against a range of conditions and evils. But this um, is evident from an earlier date in the East. Uh, an 8th century anchorite's grotto uh, from Nubia hosts Coptic texts, I've just listed them here, um, which include Gospel in Sibbets, the Letter of Christ to King Abgar of Edessa, in Coptic, which was widely used um, against illness, along with the names of the 40 martyrs of Sebast, who are represented and named at Yelani Khaleesi in this group, the Sator formula, the names of the Magi, and the names of the seven sleepers of Ephesus, along with a prayer for the soul of one Theophilus, um, who was the, um, the monk who occupied the cave. Um, so it amounts to a sort of a potent assemblage of scriptural excerpts, powerful names and symbols. And I think that the inclusion of the Nicene Creed as part of this, with these sort of talismanic frames and inscriptions, evidences a similar combination of perceived orthodoxy um, and apotropaic elements. The Sator formula um, was used here in its linear form, as it was in Eritash, preceded by the words, these are the names of the nails of Christ, evidencing a similar desire to use these powerful names to name aspects of Christian tra tradition and use them in an apotropaic manner. Apotropaic use of the square <coughs> was thus sometimes connected to the names of the Mag Magi in Eastern traditions. A small Coptic papyrus amulet against snake bite from the 6th or 7th century demonstrates a grouping that is quite similar to the representation at Eritash. Here the Sator formula is grouped with another palindrome, the Alpha Leon square, the names of the three magi, um, and a reference to the power of the nativity. At an earlier date, the names Ator, Sator, and Peritoris, a sort of a garbled use of the terms of the square, were even attributed to the magi themselves, for instance, in an early Byzantine Bible. At Eritash, the magi's more traditional names and the square's terms appear together as in the charm, as powerful apotropaic features to frame the nativity by attributing them to the shepherds. The square also came to be used in Christian charms for a successful childbirth. A 10th century amulet from Coptic Egypt, again, intended to heal and protect a woman named Kirahu, includes the Sator formula, both before and after the request for protection. The use as a powerful frame echoes, in a sense, their employment and the Athlara group. The Sator palindrome also appeared with adjurations of the angels and iterations of sacred mothers as a potent ensemble in later Western church charms that were used to guarantee safe um, childbirth. Um, and you have instances where in the Trotula, sort of a compendium of uh, gynaecological texts, where 
the Sator formula is written on butter or cheese and the pregnant women, woman was asked to, to eat it to ensure safety. So uh, this sort of, there was a connection between pregnancy and childbirth and the Sator uh, formula and which you can see later in, in Western Europe as well. And I think the decision to use these terms for the shepherd, shepherds who derived their significance from their attendance at the most sacred of births may have been a nascent expression of these later traditions. This enigmatic formula reproduced around the world for almost 2000 years seems to have owned, uh, owed its popularity precisely to its endless ingenuity and lack of determinate meaning. The mysterious open-ended nature of, a, of its signification. Its power resided in its perceived self-sufficiency and ability to elude interpretation. The strange names derived from a square shared across traditions seem not to relate in any meaningful way to the shepherds of the nativity. But this incongruity may have been where the performative power of the composition where the power of the composition resided. Influential anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski identified in his consideration of Trobriand's uh, ritual speech two verbal components that create a powerful and authoritative force in a dialectic. The coefficient of intelligibility and its counterpart, the coefficient of weirdness. Within the, late, the latter, meaningless words indicated a surpassing of the mundane world to the magical or the spiritual. And I think the coexistence here of recognisable scriptural iconographies with mysterious names may have served in a similar way to heighten the potency of the image and to bring, bring reassurance in the face of life's inevitabilities. The efficacy of the inscriptions um, formed a catalyst in applying the power of the image to the present, mediating between the sacred and profane worlds and heightening the protective nature of the nativity itself as a persuasive analogy in the face of the needs of the community. How the incorporation of this mysterious square into a Christological scene should be understood touches upon the polarized debate um, concerning magic and religion, because mm -hmm. as it's become clear, its terms appear most frequently in amuletic materials, where they seem to have wielded some form of direct agency in shaping reality. Powerful symbols and inscriptions that fell on the margins of official orthodox belief structures have only received intermittent attention within Byzantine studies. However, the varied materials covered within magical studies have recently assumed greater importance because of the increased interest in the agency of material culture across the humanities, most notably within the field of material religion. Um, and as part of this push towards a sort of an ontological democratization, the dismantling of hierarchies between humans, animals and objects, which is a form of protest against the Anthropocene, and also between high and low cultures, alongside the ongoing post-colonial interrogation of dichotomies between pure religion and primitivism. The result has been a gradual erosion of both the terminology around magic um, and also the idea of a distinct area of inquiry, a departure from isolating magical materials within their own esoteric category. The Athara churches have certainly been subjected to uh, what is often an ethnocentric bias entailed um, in the term magic, with all of its implications of alterity, primitivism, superstition, exoticism and illegitimacy both romanticised and orientalised since Hans Roth first travelled there and characterised this valley of death as exuding a savage and unspoiled grandeur. The treatment of the style of the Athlara churches has been marginalising. Errors in inscription, uh, their brutal colour palette and unrefined draftsmanship um, have been seen as belonging to another world, simultaneously pushed eastwards and associated with the provincial, an undocumented community, worlds apart from the refinement of Constantinople. Nicole Thierry supposes they may even have belonged to a heterodox um, sect with Gnostic and Julius leanings. Interpretations of their powerful names and unusual iconographies have been affected by both Western rationalism and romanticism, but I think it's time for a reappraisal. Um, since in re recent years it's becoming increasingly apparent that it's our understanding um, that needs to be of religion that needs to be more expansive 
rather than distancing widespread practices to the margins as magic. Magic has persisted as a discrete area of academic inquiry since its birth within the nascent discipline of anthropology in the 19th century. Because of the perceived need to describe words, symbols and images um, and practices that seem to sort of wield an immediate and quasi-autonomous agency, the second half of the 20th century saw efforts to integrate such phenomena into theological and philosophical studies through diversifying the terminology used to describe them as popular, folklorized, ordinary, or um, ritually powerful. But they still belonged to a polarity with the religious expression of the highly literate elite. What we find in the Itlara churches probably wouldn't have endeared them to the patriarch of Constantinople. And the proliferation of churches in the region, many of which appear to be private funerary foundations, means that tight episcopal regulation of ritual and imagery was not feasible. feasible. The small idiosyncrasies that we find here betray aspects of everyday Christian practices in this community. It's hard, really hard to escape that sense of a sort of a high and low binary, but the term everyday is being used here to characterise the expression rather than the conceptualisation of religion, to challenge the prioritisation of elite written sources in the creation of historical narratives, and thus the experience of the few rather than the many, whose epistemological structures were primarily oral, material and visual. The imagery in these churches provides a glimpse into one community's expression of Christianity. The everyday religion of a broader swathe of the population of the Eastern Roman Empire with its material and oral entanglements is accessible through less expensive, often portable forms of material culture, particularly the lar large quantities of amulets that survive from across the Greco-Roman, Jewish and Christian worlds. Professor of Religion John Gager highlights, however, their marginalisation on scholarship because of the danger they pose to the reputation of both classical antiquity and Christianity as, and I quote, bastions of pure philosophy and true religion, end quote. The ability to know and utter the names of relative, um, relevant spiritual parties to counter the unremitting threat to one's family and livelihood was prominent across cultures, so that parchment, paper and metal amulets hosting names proliferated. Names and motifs used across the Atlara churches can be found transcending cultural and religious boundaries in Jewish amulets, Coptic materials, and across the Greek magical papyri, a compendium of ritual compositions, spells, recipes, and hymns from Greco-Roman Egypt from around the 2nd century BC to the 5th century CE. And really, it was shared needs across different groups in the ancient and medieval worlds that led to the spread of powerful names, motifs, and palindromes across smaller objects of material culture. Um, and I think the powerful terms at Eri Tash probably derived from such traditions. The trials faced by Byzantine families, um, the trials faced by Byzantine families probably informed the interest in the nativity scenes within Cappadocian cycles, and the extension and elaboration with protective elements at Eritash of the nativity was probably um, informed by the sort of the, the trial space by families as well. The primary purpose of marriage in Byzantium was the creation of children, and for two or three children to survive into adulthood to provide for you in old age, a woman needed to give birth at least six times. A woman who became eligible for marriage at puberty, but mostly married in the mid-teens, teens, also had a high chance of dying in the process. Childbirth was a perilous process in ancient and medieval societies, and divine intervention was key, explaining why it produced most amuletic materials across traditions. The odds were stacked against the family unit in Byzantium, which was also the primary unit of economic production. And so apotropaic materials were abundant in relation to the spheres of marriage and childbearing. In the 10th century life of Timaeus of Lesbos, the parents of the saint were sterile, and it tells us that it affected them like iron collars laid upon them and binding them all around. The terminology of binding speaks to the prevalent worldview that saw the cosmos as populated by hostile forces which sought to bind and frustrate the ideal uh, divine blueprint for human life. Such was the perceived threat to women and children that a whole industry grew up around their protection 
because the survival of children was both a personal and a community affair. Many written amulets on ephemeral materials have disappeared, but Byzantine amulets made from metal, glass, clay and stone, along with amuletic rings, belts and armbands, survive mostly from the 6th and 7th centuries. Many comprise Christological images focused on the birth and death of Christ, along uh, without miracles, again in this case, along with apotropic motifs and inscriptions like the Holy Rider, Spearing Demons, the Chinubis, known as the Master of the Womb, ring signs and excerpts from Psalm 90, which was the apotropaic psalm. The inscriptions on many of these objects demonstrate that they were intricately connected to, to the protection of the family, and it seems many belonged to women. A silver armband, perhaps from eastern Anatolia, now in Toronto, has an inscription from Psalm 90, and it calls for health and grace and a plea for the Theotokos to help Anna. Beside a virgin and child enthroned, alongside a holy rider saint and narrative Christological imagery on its medallions. It's also highly significant that the main body of amuletic materials um, that survived to us from the middle Byzantine period are those concerned with uterine problems. Um, so the, continue, the continuation of personal worn protective items was predominantly in the sphere of familial and reproductive health from early to middle Byzantium. Uterine amulets, mostly from the 10th to 12th century from Asia Minor, Minor but also from Egypt, usually have a face with Medusa-like radiating serpents, often with an inscription that begins womb black blackening, demonstrating that these were to combat the perceived evils caused by the rogue womb. The protective emblem of the Holy Rider Saint conquering a female figure is often included too. Connecting these amulets to the age-old belief spread through oral, written and material culture in a female demon who brings harm to pregnant women and infants, Abizu or Gilu in Byzantine texts, but with other harmful secret names, who's often foiled by the recitation of powerful names. In the apocryphal testament of Solomon, this female demon tells the protagonist that her name is Abizuth, and she is thwarted by the name of the angel Raphael written on a piece of, pa of papyrus at the time of birth. This practice of using powerful names for the protection of childbearing women and infants was of ancient foundation in both the Greco-Roman and Jewish worlds. Amulets with incantations against the similar child-killing female demon called Lilith are found in the Geneza in Jewish materials. And these were often placed in the birthing room or robed and worn by Jewish women. Gilu received such prominence that she was even linked to attempted interference at Christ's birth. In a text where St. Michael encounters her, she tells him that she went to the nativity, but she was repulsed. Elsewhere, it is the devil who attempts to thwart the beginning of God's plan for salvation. It was this successful protection of Christ's birth and its general sanctity as the ideal prototype and beginning of God's plan for humanity's salvation that led to the frequent employment of the image of the nativity and the magi, within amuletic materials worn by women and children. The protective nature of its employment was sometimes made clear by accompanying motifs and inscriptions. An inscribed 6th century octagonal gold pendant reliquary with nihilo and silver hosting these scenes on the obverse has on its reverse a protective inscription which says secure salvation and repulsion of all evil things and an apotropaic cross. And indeed, the octagonal form itself was uh, deemed protective in Byzantium. And then on the, uh, it has the names of the healing saints, Cosmos and Damian, on the edge of the lid, suggesting that the protection required was primarily in the context of health, most likely reproductive health. Here, the Virgin's birth features prominently as the hallowed precedent upon which favour is requested, and the Magi as the antitype of those who desire to encounter the Virgin and Child. Moreover, the wearing of the object suggests an inherent power for the image and inscriptions themselves, as at Eri Tash. Distinctly apotropaic images of the nativity were not limited to personal worn items, and they may be discerned um, in monumental art too, such as this wall painting from the Amorphi Ecclesia from 1289, which has been discussed in this respect by Vicky Foscoli. Here the Virgin and Child of the Nativity have been um, merged with the nursing type, 
which is rare in narrative scenes before the 13th century, end of the 13th century. The apotropaic nature of the image becomes apparent through the six watching eyes that uh, punctuate the cave of Bethlehem. You can see them in the round cave. Um, they surround the nursing mother and child and clearly relate to belief in the evil eye and the damage it could, could unleash on one's life. Foscolo demonstrates that the unusual inclusion of a dog, um, which is uh, down in the right-hand corner, references the attempted interference of the devil. What's truly significant is that, again, we see apotropaic elements merged with a protective framing of the nativity, as at Eri Tash. We see the magi and the shepherds flanking the, the birth. The inclusion of the nursing type would have appealed to the physical memory of mothers, quickening their emotional connection to the image as analogous to their own experience, and thus to the protective properties of the image. Persuasive analogy was key to extending to viewers the protection embodied in the nativity as a sacred prototype. The principle of persuasive analogy, developed most fully by social anthropologist Stanley Tambaya, was inherent to many amulets from the very earliest times in terms of both content and materials. Ancient Greek spells inscribed on lead frequently appeared, uh, appealed to their medium. For example, just as this lead is cold and useless, so let my enemies be cold and useless. The recollection and utterance of relevant mythological precedents in narrative charms were also common, stemming back to ancient Egyptian practices, whereby the immediate problem could be likened to a comparable mythic incident, instance for the purpose of healing. Short scriptural passages appealing to a sacred prototype were also used as powerful tools by Jews and Christians on a par, uh, pars pro toto basis. But we also observe specific metonomic analogies performed through paradigmatic imagery. This developed from Judaism, where the rhetorical link of a biblical personage with the fate of the user is a distinctive trait in Jewish amulets from the Genazal. Couched in spiritual language, um, Jewish users asked God to grant them favour, just as he had granted favour to Old Testament patriarchs like Noah and Joseph, including sacred Old Testament matriarchs in spells for the protection of women and children. The widely understood analogous connection between sacred births and the births of ordinary women continued in Byzantium. Explaining the popularity of representations of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who overcame fertility, infertility, and Mary, women who had both successfully conceived and birthed sons, on objects that may have been used by women from an early date. Sacred births also operated as the mythical antecedent on the basis of which the unborn child could be commanded to come out safely in amuletic materials, becoming effective in the present for those citing them. Coptic charms drew on less closely related analogies, such as the narrative of Christ calling uh, Lazarus out of the tomb. A papyrus from the 5th or 6th century preserves instructions from an, for an ostracon to be placed on a woman's thigh during labour, with the words written or pronounced, come out of your tomb, Christ is calling you, demonstrating the perceived intimate connection between the womb and the tomb, between birth and death in medieval uh, society, and the value of sacred analogy in the face of such danger. It seems in this church at the heart of a burial ground, populated with the graves of women and children in this so-called valley of death, this potent imagery of the birth and nativity of Christ functioned as a persuasive narrative analogy. The nativity at every tash was the ideal antecedent, but adding powerful names to it and extending the nativity cycle with mystical scenes concerning the Magi increased its potency for the present. The flight into Egypt, the escape of the Holy Family from danger takes up a disproportionate amount of space underneath indicating that the emphasis was on the family and its protection. A viewer's interaction with imagery in this way may be best understood in terms of the similia similibus pos or pos hutu formula, just as, so also, which activated the persuasive analogies within narrative charms. This is the moment of the application of the sacred narrative to the present. Just as these sacred personages, so too I would. The image and its powerful inscriptions which surrounded the viewer in this bright and bold design 
aided in bringing this sacred and powerful moment into the present for the viewer to feel and believe it. At the heart of narrative charms was often the theme of encounter, the power and possibility of meeting the supernatural and circumstances changing. In this regard, the encounters between the shepherds and the magi, some of the first to recognize that God had come to earth with the virgin and child at the nativity, seem to exude power and possibility for the present. Um, bolstered by liturgical activities in the space, which occurred in the recurring liturgical present, users became integrated into the mythic order to experience the power of these encounters with the nativity, hoping to apply its protection to their own lives, to be protected like the Holy Family. The image and its mysterious protective names brought this powerful moment into the present for the viewer to feel it and to believe.